Right, let's get into the seven observations from the weekend, which we do on Tuesdays. Now, this may seem a little bit pedantic, Jared, but I am so sick of players getting distracted by the stupid headbands they're wearing. Mm. You watch how this often... This is the in-depth stuff that you tune this, into Sports Day yes, for. I like this. exactly right. You watch, you, you watch it now. How often... Aaron Norton has to adjust and refit that stupid 1980s style tennis headband in the middle of it. Must be distracting. I saw him on the weekend running around with a headband in his hand. I'm thinking, how are you going to mark the footy, Aaron, when you've got that stupid John McEnroe headband in your hand? I couldn't believe it. Other serial offenders I want to put on notice Nathan Murphy, serial headband adjuster offender, and his captain. Leading by poor example, Darcy Moore, serial adjuster of the headband, is a distraction. If your hair's in the way, cut it off. I'm sick of it. Have your say on that if you'd like to. Who do you reckon had the most famous headband in footy? Uh, Bruce Dool. I reckon it's Bruce. Big Carl was (laughs) the first I can remember wearing one. No one ever took his headband off. I can't believe the noise. This this big sort of toweling headband that he wears. He's carrying it around. He's, it falls off every time he goes mm. for a mark and he's yep. a job just... Anyway, I'm sick of it. Uh, observation number two as we get a bit more serious. Uh, it was interesting to watch the two best young midfields, I think, um, go around against each other on the weekend. I'd be interested in Horny's thoughts on this. Um, it was Port, the Port and the Fremantle game. Port Adelaide got the points. They were plus 10 from stoppage. And with Hayes in the ruck up against Jackson, I thought he actually did pretty well after a slow start. What I wanted to observe is the ball use, and that's what yep. separates, I think, the two midfields from Port and Freo and the contrast in that. Sarong kicked it at 29%. Now, there's some arguments how much we should rate kicking efficiency, but if only two out of your 10 are effective, I think that's an issue for Sarong. And with Brayshaw, it was, it was a bit more critical than that because he missed a couple of easy shots for goal at critical stages. And I'm not sure he's a great ball user. Andrew Brayshaw, so I just want to put that on. Well, it's been notice. it's been a big issue for yeah. them. They haven't replaced uh, Mundy yep. and his elite kicking exactly inside right. the forward fifty. We we sort of put that uh, flag that uh, pre season, and they haven't addressed it, and they need to. Yeah, I would got to get be, better at it. Uh, having a look at seeing what you can get for Darcy, and if you can add, uh, let's just say for the ideal player, a Jordan Dawson type into that Fremantle midfield, or a younger David Mundy type. That's what I would yep. be doing. Uh, for Sean Darcy, I think he's surplus to their needs. Uh, with finals out of the question, I was I was a little bit surprised that Richmond dropped these three players: Coulthard, Mansell, and Bauer. Uh, and maybe that's because they wanted to, you know, play the more experienced players in Revolt and Cochin's last game. But I'd rather see those three this week uh, over players such as Pickett, Ross, and McIntosh. So. Tigers, play the kids this week, for goodness sake. I'm not sure why you're dropping those three when finals are out of the question. That is the future. You're going to need them. Let's see if they can play uh, or not. Observation number four, I think Damien Harbuck is right to suggest that 80% of the Gold Coast's next premiership side is already on the list. But with statements as bullish as that comes high expectation. He was talking premierships and he was talking premierships in the early stages of his coaching tenure. So no longer will it be acceptable for Gold Coast to blow five gold leads against a flat opposition at home like they did against... No one's even mentioned Gold Coast. You're five goals up. The Blues are flat. You're playing at home. You lose. And no one cares. Well, we're going to care next year with Damien Hardwick there. So I think a bare minimum for them um, is to win a final. With the list that they've got, with the handouts that they're going to be given, which you often reference, Jared, and with Damien Hardwick, a three-time coaching must win a final next year at the Gold Coast. Observation number five, um, with the Bulldogs adamant they will stick by their coach, Luke Beveridge, there is obviously, and it's already started, going to be significant changes around him. One person they should consider trying to poach back is the former captain, Bob Murphy. Now, if the culture, if the relationship between players and coach, which is starting to come out publicly, is an issue... Bob Murphy is the perfect person to solve that. He's the ideal culture guy, leadership facilitator, assistant coach, all-round good club person, and they love him. Get him back in. And I would be interested to ask Brad Johnson about that tomorrow if the dogs could get Bob Murphy back from Mm. Fremantle and whether that would be a good addition to the football department staff. Uh, Observation number six, we can finally 
put to bed North Melbourne's application for a priority pick. So the submission that they put to the AFL some weeks ago should be shredded. The club is going to get the number one pick for the third season in a row. If you can't make something of that, you don't deserve anything. So has any club been given a bigger advantage in a fair time than three number one draft picks in a row plus whatever they get for Ben Mackay. And if that's pick two, then you don't need anything to do with a priority pick. One of those number one picks ended up uh, back at Port Adelaide, but they've picked up yep. potential rising star and uh, a warlord who's going to be a fantastic player. Yeah, and they, well, they have, they've got two of them. Uh, none yep. of them stayed on the list. Horn Francis went back and they, they traded the Cadman pick and did reasonably well out of it, you would think. And they've also got Port Adelaide's first round draft picks, not as high as they thought it was going to be, you know, around about that 16. But like that is just a great platform to be able to rebuild your footy club. And you don't need any more handouts than that. So the AFL should shred that paperwork pretty quickly. And finally, once again, Caroline Wilson on, on Footy Classified suggested that Brody Grundy wants out. Unsurprisingly, it's Ge- Geelong, Port Adelaide and Sydney who are after him. She mentioned the compensation though, which is w- what I was interested in. She mentioned a second round pick and Melbourne paying some of his wage. Why would they do that? Why would Melbourne only accept a second round pick and have to pay some of his wage? I'd be demanding a lot more than that. These three clubs, Port, Geelong and Sydney, are desperate for a Ruckman. You'd be wanting a back end first round and you certainly wouldn't want to be paying any of his wage. So if that is not acceptable, keep him. You've got the best backup Ruckman in the game for a 32-year-old number one who is injury-prone, it's perfect for Melbourne. They couldn't be in a better situation. I just, I wouldn't be trading Brody Grunny unless it is something significant for the footy club and significant, I mean, a first-round draft pick. These fans, what do you think? one 300 736 736 Jared, what do you I think? I get the feeling Melbourne fans would uh, absolutely agree with your first-round draft pick. I think they only... Uh Gave Collingwood a 25 mm-hmm. or 26. But but these clubs are desperate. Like, can, yeah, and I understand that. Let them, let them go to war. Let them go to war. Yeah. But I think they're entitled. I think I, I think it's out of Melbourne's hands. You think? I don't think they're going to keep him. All right. But I think that the clubs will maybe offer overs to get him because uh, they're all desperate. So you only need two people at an auction cane to uh, get over your uh, acceptable price, and that's yep. what Melbourne will be chasing. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, I mean – his input into imagine putting him Hickey's just retired. Yeah. Imagine putting him at Sydney with the midfield that they've got. I mean, they may have to pay that. It's just yep. what you, it just might be the price. I don't think they'd pay. walk at uh, at uh, you know pick twenty five yeah. versus pick eighteen. I mm. don't think there's going to be any consideration there. It's, it's just going to be a question of who wins the battle. Is it Port Adelaide because they're desperate? Yep. Is it Geelong? They're desperate. Yep. Or is it uh, going to be the Swans? Yep, Segler and Hickey retiring today. You can have your say on that. They were the seven observations from round 23. Right now, let's get to Daniel Hoyne standing by from Champion Data. But as early as April, Kane, our man Hoyne, he said that the Cats were off. In June, Hoyne flagged the issues with the Bombers' defence. There's a big tick. You're off Collingwood Hoyne two months ago, much to the dismay, disgust and disgruntlement of the faithful, warning that there were issues that needed to be addressed. There's another tick. You held your line on Melbourne, tick, when many uh, others lost faith. And you've convinced me long ago to look at the big picture of data, not wins and losses. Welcome to you. You've had a great year. Hello, G. Hello, Kane. Hello, oh, that bit... observation, Kane, that first observation of the <laughs> night was uh, has absolutely made me uh, wet myself in here, Kane. <laughs> so thank you very oh, much. I can't, I can't believe it. I mean, some you people know would let that slide through, but I'm, I'm sick of it. I've observed it. And the final straw was Norton getting knocked around. He kept going to the ground and his headband was going everywhere. I'm like, just cut your hair, would you, for goodness sake. Lots yeah. of support on the text for you, uh, Kane. Very uh, true, Ree Norton's headband. He just it so often it must affect his concentration and his accuracy. Spot on corn about the headbands. Geelong is the worst with about six or eight mm. players wearing them. Better a headband than a man bun. Mm. What would you agree there? No, at least yes or the, no? Uh, if the man bun is tight and it stays in position and right. it's not distracting, you're not touching it all the okay. time and really vain with how you're looking. Well, I think it's a vanity thing with a lot of these guys. So... I'm okay with the man bun. The, just the headband's been, been doing me. Do you in. know what? I, I never thought in my life I'd be sitting here with Kane and we're talking about hairstyles <laughs> and, what, and what works and what doesn't work. I, I never thought I'd well, be part it, of that conversation. It's interesting because, <laughs> like, uh, we, we lost a game. Um, it was my second last game. We went to the Gabba and we played Brisbane and we should have beaten them at that stage. And we played poorly. 
And instead of doing the review on the Monday, Ken Hinckley said, boys, we're going to do the review as soon as we get back to the hotel. And you know when he says that, he did it off like very – it was rare for him to do that. So you knew you were in all sorts of trouble. And there was one player, as he's going through his review, that he singled out, and he demanded that he cut his hair. Right. So this would have been 2015. Now, it's, things have moved a little bit, and mm -hmm. coaches are more accepting of things like long sleeve guarantees and the way players look and the way – they dress at training perhaps, but he gave it to this one player about cutting his hair and the player dirtied up and it was a sign of the way I think the modern player now thinks and acts. Mm. And I still think there is room for a coach to say to you, your hair is getting in your eyes when you go in the footy, you look stupid, cut your hair. But I don't think Jared and Hoiny coaches can say that now because players are a little bit more sensitive than perhaps they were in, in your day. I think you're spot on, yeah, Kane. Yeah. There's a the number of players running around I think that could probably do with a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's a taboo issue. Yeah. Let's get stuck into the numbers, though, because uh, we have got the um, data man here. Kosh is a big fan, as are many people around the nation. It's the number one podcast in the land, uh, yours, Hoiny. Um, well, for us, anyway. And uh, let's get stuck into it. What have you got for us? The overall observations? Yeah, so I heard, um, you know, Kane and Bucks yesterday morning, and Bucks in particular, um, you know, bringing to light the defensive, you know, numbers, if you like, of, um, you know, of some certain teams that are actually, you know, heading in a positive direction and those that actually have some concerns, um, you know, there at the moment in that aspect of the game. And, um, you know, there's, you know, there's numerous ways in which you can actually measure defense other than just raw points against, um, if you like. And I just wanted to bring up a conversation that we had, um, on this, um, on this station, probably about seven or eight weeks ago. Yep. And that's around the balance of defense, if you like. So the combination of being able to restrict your opposition from generating entries and then being able to restrict the opposition from scoring once they go in. Mm. So being able to get that combination right has been key to success in 15 of the last 18 premiers. 15 of the last 18 have ranked top six at denying entries and then denying scores once they're in. And this is why this competition this year is so, so hard to actually work out at the moment. Because out of all the finalists that we've got heading into September, there is only one team that he's doing both at the moment. Who is it? Melbourne. Mm. Melbourne are the only ones. So Melbourne are fifth for denying entries, but then once they're in, they are the hardest team in the comp to score against. We have potentially four of the finalists that are top six at restricting entries, mm. and that being Collingwood, Brisbane, Port, and the Dogs. But none of them are also top six at being able to deny the opposition from scoring. We have three of the finalists who are top six at restricting the opposition from scoring, that being Carlton, St Kilda and Sydney, but they're not top six at denying entries. And then you've got GWS who sit outside the top six in both areas at the moment. So to have only one of the, um, of the contenders to be top six in both areas at the moment um, is, is really interesting. We sort of haven't had that heading into a final series for a mm. number of years. We usually have two to three to four sitting in that bracket. So I only have one this year is, um, is actually quite, um, you know, sort of quite surprising. I can remember 2018 and uh, right throughout the season of 2018, we were talking about uh, West Coast Eagles' lack of winning contested ball. And they push back against it and saying they've got their own system of measuring it. And uh, we kept pushing back to them. You can't win it unless you win the contested ball numbers. And uh, and and ultimately, they won the premiership. Mm. But the four weeks of the finals, they won the contested ball. Is it possible for one of these teams that uh, haven't got the double act right now over the next four weeks, despite the fact that you say you are who you are at this stage, yep. to address that problem? Absolutely. Anything's always possible. And, and you know, our stuff is just going to go back over history and actually, you know, paint the picture in terms of what has been the keys for success. But there's always going to be a time where a team is actually going to buck that trend or mm. change the trend or actually change the narrative around that particular story, if you like. So absolutely any of those, you know, other eight, you know, possible finalists can change their profile and do something different in September. Um, but to only have one um, to be able to be sitting in that bracket at the moment is um, is quite surprising. Just for clarification, I heard a commentator uh during the week, talking about uh, the lack of winning a contested ball. And he essentially, 
I think, misunderstands what contested ball is. The view was essentially hard ball get. And yet there's so many other elements to the contested ball yeah. that never get discussed. I mean, mm. I think the, the narrative around contested ball is so misunderstood, it needs explaining. Yeah, and I heard, um, I heard Kenny Hinckley after the Geelong game a couple of weeks ago sort of, you know, you know, sort of make that statement as well in his um, in his press conference, and you know they lost the free kick count. I think it was by thirteen or fourteen or fifteen, whatever it was, mm. and that was the actual difference in the overall contested possession yeah. number because free kicks are actually part of the contested possession game. So you know there are you know I think you know anywhere between seven to ten ways in which you can actually win a um, a type of contested possession. So it is a pretty broad number. Um, Horny, if you like, who would you rather play in the first final if you Port Adelaide? Or Melbourne, you've you've got the choice, right? You, you get to mm. choose. Would you rather play Collingwood at the MCG, or would you rather play Brisbane at the Gabba? You can choose. Collingwood, uh, Collingwood at the G. Yeah, at so, the moment, Collingwood yeah. at the G. I guess yeah. particularly even more so if you're Melbourne, like they'd much yeah. rather play Collingwood at the G, if uh, of course. But it, it highlights the fact that you know maybe finishing third is worse than finishing yeah. fourth. Yeah, it is interesting because I heard you guys talk about this, um, you know, on the way in tonight around Carlton and, you know, whether or not they have actually anything to play for this week. I think they have a truckload to play for if results go according to plan because that fifth position for Carlton is critical because that, you know, that then allows you the opportunity to stay in Melbourne in week two of the finals mm. as opposed to travelling in week two of the finals. If you're Melbourne this week, you know, the, you know, the inability, you know, or, you know, sort of to avoid travelling week one of finals and play at the MCG is so important. So you mm. want to try and navigate that situation, I think, to launch your campaign from fourth and actually start at the MCG. Yeah. Are you anticipating a Carlton Collingwood second uh, semi-final? No, I haven't even haven't looked, that, okay. haven't looked that far ahead. I haven't Don't upset them early? No, no. Me and the Collingwood supporters, gee, we don't get along like a house on fire. Okay. So I'll avoid, I'll avoid that yeah, one. It, it is because <laughs> Port Adelaide play Richmond before Melbourne play Sydney. Um, mm. So they may not want to jump over no. Adelaide and, and no. whether they can manipulate that result to make that the case would be the smart thing to do. So, I mean, we're all going to watch and look for storylines this weekend. That may be one to watch mm. to see what to see what Melbourne do. Let's get into your seven main talking points. You've touched on the Ds. You want to go further? Yeah, so I just want to touch on one aspect for Melbourne um, that I think was really evident in their um, in their 2021 um, you know successful campaign, and that was their ability to be able to run over the opposition and really sort of just outlast them in a fitness battle, yep. um, if you like. So in 2021, they outscored their opposition by over 130 points in final quarters, which was the third best of any team in the competition that um, that season, and that was sort of you know really evident in their finals campaign in particular, sort of you know running over Geelong, running over the Dogs, and running over. Brisbane in week one um, of the finals as well. That aspect of the of their um, of their campaign in 2022 dropped significantly in the second half of last year, where they were actually outscored by 110 points mm. in final quarter. So you can remember a lot of last year they actually went into three quarter time leading a lot of their games, but they just ran out of juice. If you think back to you know that final against Sydney, they led at half time. Mm. If you think back to the final against Brisbane, they led at half time, but they just ran out of gas. This year, they are by far and away the best fourth quarter team in the competition. They're so off they, the French food this year. Yeah, so they have that running capability back. And you know, we've seen over the last three years, you know, Geelong last year were clearly the best fourth quarter team in the competition. Mm -hmm. Melbourne, as I said, in 2021 was so strong. And again, now Melbourne in 2023 are the best fourth quarter team um, in the competition. So they've been able to actually do that over, over the last eight weeks reasonably well. Um, and it's just an aspect where they've been able to sort of, you know, get their game back to where it was in 2021 as opposed to where it was in 2022. Good signs for the Demons. What about the Saints? So I just want to put one St Kilda midfielder um, on watch in a in a good way. So we spoke about Brad Crouch. Um, oh, you know, you know, it probably would have been six to ten weeks ago that his inability, you know, his ability to not impact the games from a scoreboard perspective was you know rated amongst you know the lower end um, of midfielders in the competition. His last six weeks, he's now close to a top sixty player um, in the competition. So he's going extremely well as opposed to being around about that two hundred and fiftieth mm. rated player um, you know, in in the competition six weeks ago. And it is that re and and it is that ability to be able to turn his possessions into a score over the last six weeks, which has now elevated this St Kilda midfield group to be you know slightly more threatening. But what it's done in particular. It has allowed their best player in Jack Sinclair to now play permanent halfback flank mm -hmm. again. 
So in three of his last four matches, he has played 100% time in defence. Whereas, you know, his previous, you know, five to six weeks, he's only spending 30% of his time in defence. Now, as a result of him playing behind the ball, they now have that counter-attack footy back in play. They are generating the third most points off turnover in the competition. And I think a lot of it is to do with this guy playing behind the ball. His creativity behind there has been um, absolutely exceptional. So well done, Brad Crouch, which has now freed up their best player to be in his most damaging position. Yeah, it's always been, uh, well, until this recent resurgence, it's break glass, put uh, Sinclair into the middle, which has uh, robbed them. So nice observation from you, from the data, Hoiny. Uh, Bulldogs? Yeah, so just wanted to you know touch on the dogs and just you know what's actually happened with them over the last seven or eight years, and mm. it's just been a really consistent theme you know in three aspects of the game, in three critical aspects. So their inability to deny the ball movement of the opposition from going one end of the ground to the other. Only once in seven years have they ranked in the top seven teams in the competition. This year they're eighth. So it's not disastrous, but they're just not in the top echelon of the competition. In, in seven of seven seasons since winning the flag, they have not ranked top six at conceding scores per entry, like we just talked about yep. before where you need to be. Seven of seven. Again, this year, they are outside that bracket. Only marginally, but again, they are outside that bracket. In terms of winning the ball back off the opposition close to goal, since 2015, they have not been top six in any of their seasons since 2015. This year, they're 11th. So those role players, so everyone talks about the list and everyone talks about Bont and Liber and English and, and, and you know, the list can go on. I think it's those role players on the periphery that we've actually spoken a little bit about on this show. So the Fords, so Jones and Garcia and McNeil and West and McComb, there's been so many changes week to week. They haven't been able to settle down that aspect of the game. Their wingers, the wingers play such critical roles in being able to actually, you know, sort of facilitate those absolute stars of the game to be able to let them do what they need to do. And then these guys come in and do the dirty work, if you like. We've seen Baker being in and out of the team this year. Williams dropped occasionally and then Poulter in and out of the team as well. So there's just a couple of issues there for the dogs, which they just need to settle down to be able to become a consistently good team. See if they can sort it out in the next seven years. Orny, how good are you? Can you give us the clues in 25 seconds? Very quick. I turn about the turnover game a lot. The turnover game is king. Last six weeks, this team, 11th for points scored off turnover, 15th for points against from turnover, 14th best turnover team in the comp. Must be a good team. Have your guesses through now. My man, Benny Perkins, who's usually very accurate on these guesses, is suggesting it could be Collingwood. Well, I thought it may have been Collingwood, but then I thought, when he's upset the Pies fans enough, he's not going to bag the Pies fans again. Is he scared of the Pies fans? Yeah, (laughs) no, he's he's been tormented. Yeah, I think he is. So he's gone soft on Collingwood. So it's not Collingwood, all right? Who is it, Hoiny? No, it's not Collingwood. So this team, last six weeks, that's what we always look at, six-week profile, 11th for points from turnover, 15th for points against, making them the fifth worst turnover team in the comp. What I believe? It is Carlton. Mm. Carlton. So I just, want to put, I just want to put the Blues turnover profile on watch. Um, and the reason why, just to reiterate why we always talk about the turnover game, is that 15 of the last 17 premiers have ranked top three in the turnover game, and close to 60% of your score comes off the back of the turnover game, purely because you have double the opportunity to score from turnover than what you do clearance. So, um, Where was it? So so it got me thinking when I had a look at this the other day, and I was actually quite surprised. This is heading into the game against Gold Coast on on Saturday, and then you see them give up 71 points off turnover to Gold Coast um, on the weekend. And... Um, yeah, so I had a, yeah, so then I started having a bit of a look at it, and I, you know, and I went back and just had a look at their nine game period. So the whole nine games, well, they've got nine in a row. They're still only the eighth best turnover team in the competition, and their scoring off turnover has only increased by four points mm. compared to where it was after round thirteen. So all their damage is coming from clearance. They are brutal at clearance. They are clearly the best clearance team in the competition. And but over the last six weeks, yeah, so they've averaged fifty points per game from clearance, and forty six per game from turnover. That is unheard of to to be scoring more off the back of what you're doing in the clearance game yep. in the turnover game, and that that profile there is an unsustainable profile that won't lead to success if it continues like that over a finals campaign. And I've been big on Carlton. Yep. And, you know, as we talked about seven or eight weeks ago, comparing them to Melbourne of 2021, 
But unless that turn, they, they, they are doing so much right elsewhere, so much right, but they just need to turn that turnover profile around. Otherwise, history suggests that is not a sustainable brand come finals time. Just some news for the Blues fans, as we spoke about moments ago. They have now confirmed on the back of Riley Beveridge's report that Jack Silvani experienced a second joint sprain in his knee during his return through the VFL on the weekend. It's going to be unavailable against GWS. His return to play will become clearer in the next week once the club works through the best approach for his rehab. Better news for Lockie Fogarty, Chera, Walsh, Kennedy, McGovern, all players aiming to be available for selection against GWS but need to complete full training later in the week to put their hand up for selection. That's from the Blues. Let's move on to your uh, fourth talking point, Horny, and that is the Crows. Yes, there's a few texts coming through here around Adelaide and their season as well. So, um, no, quite topical. So, so they've done so much right this year, Adelaide, clearly done so much right. So they've got a percentage of 115%, which is the eighth best percentage of any team to have 10 plus wins. Highest scoring side in the 70 comp, years. Yeah. 70, like, so it's pretty, it's, you know, it's a pretty impressive performance. And given that, you know, based on their team on the weekend, you know, they were the third least experienced team on the weekend and the fifth youngest team. Um, on the weekends, but so if you and there's a few questions coming here, as I said, around what Adelaide need to do in 2024. For me, it's purely just you know shoring up that defensive group and tightening up that defensive group. And I know and I understand that they, were, that they were you know sort of hamstring a little bit by you know Doty and um, and and Murray and then Butts at the end of the year. Mm. Mark Keane actually looked okay, I thought yeah. in his last in his last four or five I games. Got some good young him. ones, I reckon. Don't mind Borlase. I don't mind Worrell. I know he's not a key defender. Worrell, he's more your third or your fourth, hopefully interceptor. Hinge has had a good year. So they have the positive, given those players some game time through necessity. They've had to. Um, yeah, so at least that's been one positive out of it. They've got a good young core group of, of defenders. Yeah, and we spoke about that group, I think, you know, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, their list management team have done extremely well to actually put together that part of the ground, yeah. given where they've actually come from. So it's just whether or not any of that group can then elevate themselves to another level next year and actually, you know, sort of become that elite interceptor that so many, um, you know, successful teams have, have had over the journey. So obviously, you know, so probably Dodie's not going to be there for best part of half the year. So who is that elite interceptor going to mm. be? Is it going to be Hinge? Is it going to be Worrell? To be able to, to be able to shore up that defensive group, they did have a dream run from an injury perspective for, you know, for the majority um, of the season. They did so much right offensively. Their turnover game was fantastic. Their pressure was fantastic. I think it's just shoring up that defensive group, um, you know, is, is where they need to get to to be able to then absolutely cement themselves like their in midfield? finals calculation. I don't mind their midfield. Mm. I think they could look to inject some more speed. talent um, into that into that midfield group. I think they're honest. Um, I think that you know Dawson had a fantastic season. Crouch has finished off well, but just to just get that you know extra point of difference player in there with a little bit of agility to be able to break out of stoppage and be really damaging with ball in hand. That's where I'll sort of be looking at as well as the defensive half. Of the I wonder player. if that can be Rankin, Jared, and play a similar role to Tom Papley to go to centre bounce and then cool. do some damage forward. Well, I think Papley is the prototype. Uh, got no problems with that. He, he was amazing on the weekend. I'm not sure where he rode it, but he would have been he in the top fans, three on the game. He was fantastic ground. on the weekend. Despite only kicking one goal, his ability to be able to impact the game was um, was superb. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Kane's old mob, Port Adelaide. Yeah, Port. So very similar to Carlton that we just touched on before. So I don't know what you think, Kane or Jared here, but sort of watching that game on Sunday and watching Port over the last couple of weeks, and maybe this is just oversimplifying it or not, but I think for their finals campaign, it is going to come down to Butters, Rosie and Horn Francis yep. and how big of a September they actually have. Because their clearance work at the moment, along with Carlton, is absolutely brutal. So almost one in three of their clearances are actually going into the scoreboard over the last over the last six weeks. AFL average is about one in four mm. um, you know, of, of your clearances go onto the scoreboard. Butters at the moment has got his form back. Over the last six weeks, off our new rating system, the 100X, he's the fourth best player in the competition. For me... For me, Rosie's the one. Um, I, I know Rosie's numbers might look okay on the surface in terms of what he's doing, but he's only had he's only had ten plus contested possessions once in his last six weeks. So he is winning a lot of his outside, um, you know, a lot of outside ball, which is okay. But if you're winning that much outside ball, you want to be significantly impacting the game with ball in hand. Mm. And his ball and his ball use over the last um, over the last couple of weeks just isn't at the okay. top echelon of his game. So Zach Butters' his ball use at the moment is through the roof yep. in terms of what he's doing. 
Rosie is a fair way off what Butters is doing at the moment. And I think if he's going to have that profile of winning so much ball on the outside, he needs to, he needs to be able to impact the game more in terms of what he's doing with ball in hand. So those three for me are the ones that are going to determine whether or not, you know, or sort of how far this team goes because their Ford 50 at the, at the moment isn't functioning that well. And their D50 at the moment is the easiest D50 to score against in the competition. Without being uh, cute, that's why they're vulnerable to a Finn McGuinness. Mm. I mean, if, you're, if, if, if you can take out one of the three and, re- and reduce him to five possessions or six possessions, mm. you're down to only two magnets actually generating and the, at the, the score. And at the moment, that one is, is butters, butters that yeah. you're going straight yeah, to. Yeah, because I mean, Horn Francis is, is not at the level where he's a consistent four-quarter performer no. yet. He's a burst player. He gets... A chunk of possessions in a short space of time, and then you don't see him for a large portion of the game. Now that will come, I'm sure. I'm I'm absolutely certain of it. But as a 20 year old who's finding his way and hasn't done a preseason, so you're right. If you can put the ice block on on Butters, then it's Rosie and and a cameo from Horn Francis at the moment. Now I had a bit of a uh, tater tote with Sam last night about uh, Tom McCartan. It, It just looked unusual to me that whole incident. And uh, Tom McCartan's ban has been thrown out. He's yeah. free to play. What do you think? Which I reckon will surprise a lot of people. What do you think, Jerry? No, I, th- I thought there was a. I, I just there was a set of circumstances. That ball turning right. I, I, I reckon he's almost protecting himself yeah. rather than going like a full on bump. Yeah, no, I agree. I, 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 it's not right for him to miss a final for that. Now he was asked at the tribunal, he said, did you try and bump him? He said, no. They said, did you try and brace for contact? He said, no. He's almost saying, I couldn't have done anything else. No. Like, I, in that moment, in that split second, that was about as much caution as I could show in that moment. And I, I tend to agree. So well done to the Swans for challenging it. And I guess the significance of it is that it's a big, big win. For the Swans. I mean, without yep. him, Hoiny, it's going to be mm. tough. His brother's not there now. And, mm. you know, you're going to put Aaron Francis back there and, and mm. Rampy, who's had an interrupted season. There's not a lot after him. Yeah, and we saw how vulnerable they were in that period with all those key defenders, you know, out behind the ball. And that defensive 50 is actually functioning extremely well at the moment. And it's well done to the tribunal because, like, as much as, uh, as much as we absolutely need to address the issues of head bumps and... I reckon I started a campaign against head bumps in about mm. mid nineties. Mm. That if, if we've still got to play every every case on its merits yep. and just can't, uh, you know, be looking for the linchpin. Hey, I'm looking, looking for the lynching. Jared for De Horny's predictions. So in a matter of moments, he's going to predict the premier, the runner up, the Brownlow, and yeah. the rising star. Before we do that, your last talking point is the cats, Horny. Yeah. So I just wanted to just have this conversation. Um, you know. Yeah, well, well, pretty much this is the last time that we're going to be talking about Geelong for the year. Mm. I, I don't think, I don't think this era is actually over yet for the Cats, and I think they've got. Now this is I, going to be pricking a few ears of the Cats supporters. Aren't yeah, you? so I, I, I think they have the ability to launch again yep. in in twenty twenty four. So these were just for a couple of reasons. So they had, the, yeah, so they were impacted the fourth most by injury of any team in the comp this year. Down back, they were. An, an absolute mess in terms of their consistency with that defensive group. So they had 11 players, you know, be able to rotate through mm. that defensive group, um, you know, this season. As a result, they were the third easiest team in the competition to score um, you know, against once they actually went inside their Ford 50, which has never happened under Chris Scott's reigns. And then you think about, you know, their percentage. So everyone's, you know, in love in terms of what Adelaide are doing, which mm. is fair enough. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pumping them up as well. Geelong's percentage this year was 114%. Mm. That's the ninth best percentage we've seen in 70 years with a team of a, of a, of a 10 win, of a 10 win season. They lost five games by under two goals this year. And only, and everyone talks about the Mulligans. Only once did this team have an absolute shocker. And that was on the weekend against St. Kilda, where it just looked like everything had fallen out mm. of the group. You look at the list and the list in terms of the youngsters and in terms of the, you know, the older guys that everyone's just waiting for them to tip over. I don't think the balance is as bad as what actually, as what everyone thinks. They've got a fullback who's 22. They've got a centre half back who's 24. They've got three other defenders who are absolutely locks in that team who are 24, 25 and 25. Those high half forwards that we talk about that are so important to your structure, Myers, Close and Stengel, 24, 24, 25. They've got Jai Clark, who's a top 10 pick that we didn't mm. see this year, who's 18. Tanner Bruin came on this year, who, who's 21. Max Holmes is 20. Atkins is only 27. 
So, and then you think back to the end of 2021 where everyone else thought that they were gone at the end of prelim final where they lost by 83 points with an old list as well. Yep. And it only took three inclusions of Sam DeConning, Max Holmes and Tyson Stengel to then re, re-energize the list and actually, and actually then explode and then, and then change the fortunes of that team yep. as well as then changing the magnets of Blitzarves and Atkins. So I don't, think, I don't think that where they're at at the moment is as bad and as you know, era-ending, if you like, as what, some, um, as what some might think and that they can actually launch against with actually having a fresh... Yeah, an extra five weeks off, yep. get the surgeries done, and then launch into a full preseason this year, yep. as opposed to this year where it was just completely disjointed. And a full preseason, as you said, and they'll be plotting the list moves that they make as well. They they know exactly what they're doing. They're in good hands, and I tend to agree with you there. Right on the other side of this, Horny's predictions, the Premier, the runner-up, the Brownlow, the rising star, and a stack of your questions. We'll do that next. Horny, who's going to win the flag? Yeah, I was uh, I was a bit rattled today when I was having a look at the coaches' votes. So I actually couldn't find. I had to oh, ring Lawrence hidden. and say, "Where are they? They're, they're hidden for two weeks." So um, anyway, so we're going with the predictions. So we're going to go a little bit ahead of time. So Premier for me will um, is Melbourne um, at the moment. And that's mm. purely based off their two words that you hear constantly coming out of Melbourne: defense and contest. Defense is number one. Contest is number one. It's a pretty hard team to crack. So um, who are they going to be playing? Uh, for me, it is Brisbane that they will that, yeah, that they will be playing. So, yeah, offensively, that is their point of difference. Um, where they are, uh, in, you know, in terms of where they're going to start their finals campaign, should they get the job done this week? And they are the number one turnover team in the competition, and we know that that historically stacks up with success. Well, 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 that's thrown a spanner in the works. The Collingwood fans are going to come for you. So, in that first final, if it is the way that we think it's going to go, Melbourne and Collingwood, you would be suggesting that, that Melbourne are good enough to beat them and probably will beat them in the first final. Yeah, I'd say I'd be tipping Melbourne to yeah. beat Collingwood. I wouldn't, as I said, I think Collingwood are a chance yes. to beat them. So yeah. Collingwood supporters, please don't forget about that. But I think, but I'll be tipping Melbourne to beat All right. them. Who yep. wins the Brownlow, Horny? Um, so two hats here. The champion data Brownlow system has Nick Dacos winning it um, on uh, on 28 votes at the moment. So we need, uh, well, yeah, so that, yeah, they How need accurate has that been over the journey? Uh, it's recently. been pretty accurate in terms of a guide, as a, yeah. as a pretty strong guide for a, you know, a top three to top five finish. Um, and then, yeah, we have Petrarca second at 27 votes. Um, so just behind Nick Dacos there. But for me, the one to watch is Zach Butters. I keep talking about how good this guy is. That 13 game period where they won 13 matches in a row, I think he's going to poll a lot of votes. He's now back into red hot form mm-hmm. as well, and Porter starting to win some games. So I think he's going to be a uh, a huge chance to be able to challenge Dacos. Yeah. All right. What about the rising star? We know your love for Mitch Owens. Yeah, so still Mitch Owens for me. Um, yeah, he has been um, a little bit quieter of late. Um, yeah, as well. You know, she it, it is a high end you know sort of talent this mm. year. She Sheasel is performing exceptionally well as well. Ashcroft has has performed exceptionally well. But for what Owens has done this year and the role that he's played, um, you know, this year is actually quite exceptional. We talk a lot about contested possessions, as you said. There's different ways in which you can win contested possessions. Between the arcs is key. And in general, and in general play, it is key. He is the number one contested possession player in the competition in that phase of the game. Between ahead, the arcs, ahead of only Christian Petrarca, Zach Butters, and Shy Bolton, and all those three might be walk up all Australians, um, you know, this year as well. So his year in terms of how he's impacted the game has been absolutely exceptional. How was the debate on the rising star? Uh... No, no debate on the rising star, Jared. No. You just individual oh, voters yes, yes. just go okay. off and submit your own vote so you don't consult on the yep. rising star. Uh, let's get to your gem and your horror, and we'll start with a good horny. Yeah, start with the gem. So I just want to give um, Jeremy McGovern some love. So it was really good watching his performance and you know, you know, and just seeing him back in play yep. this year. So over a per hundred minutes, um, sort of you know, sort of game time this year, he's again the number one rated key defender in the competition this year. So he's he's still impacting matches significantly. Um, you know, this year, you know, per hundred minutes, averaging four intercept marks per game. How many minutes is, do you have to uh, play? Going to get in the All Australian oh, side. He's miles off the All Australian team. He's missed 15, 15 <laughs> games over his. When he wasn't on the ground, when he was off yeah. for that attention, it was withered and trying to play key defender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't it wasn't a loss. Didn't look good. Didn't look good. Oh, didn't uh, what, what about your horror, Horny? This is so surprising. The- uh, so the horror is just a horror to watch, and I don't want to be referring to this horror next Tuesday, and that's Brisbane. 
just get past this game on Saturday against St Kilda. Everyone assumes that you're finishing second and you're going to start your campaign from mm. second. I refer back to Adelaide in 2016 where they hit the last game of the year in second and everyone assumed they were going to finish second. They lost the last home mm. and away game of the year at home. It ruined their finals campaign starting in fifth. West Coast in 2019. They started in round 23 yep. in the top four. Everyone thought, here they come, here they come. They had a home game in round 23. They thought it was a shoe-in against Hawthorne. They got rolled. They started their campaign from fifth. It blew up everything. I love it. Brisbane, don't, don't, don't do that on Saturday. Mm, Just I get the job done. Love it. We know Chris Fagan's a big fan of the show as well. He will be listening, and that is a warning. Now, Horny, outstanding from you. Um, we got through a fair bit of ground. We'll post your predictions to our social media account just to keep you accountable and, and so you can get the feedback, <laughs> which I know you love. But, hey, we'll, we'll speak to you next week. But uh, congratulations to all the work you've done.